My name is Becky Senf. I'm Norton Family Curator here at the Center for Creative Photography. It's a joint appointment with Phoenix Art Museum. Before we get started, I'd like to encourage you to silence your cell phones if you have not done so already. I'd also like to let you know about some upcoming programs. On Tuesday, April 15th at 5.30 p.m., Rebecca Nijowski will speak about her work in a talk entitled Desert Pictures. On Tuesday, April 22nd at 5.30, Sama al Shaibi will give a presentation entitled Sand Brushes In about desert, the border, and the body in her work. Thursday, May 1st at 5.30, Rosalind Solomon will present Jumping Off Place, How My Life Imitates My Work. Tonight is my great pleasure to introduce Kate Palmer Albers, who will in turn introduce Pel Penelope Umbrico and will lead what is sure to be a very lively conversation. Kate Albers is assistant professor in the art history division at University of Arizona, and her specialty is the history and theory of photography. Her research has explored the relationship between photography, memory, and history, and another of Dr. Albers' persistent research interests is photography and volume. She recently published an article on the topic, Abundant Images and the Collective Sublime, in the Society for Photographic Education's fall 2013 issue, of their journal exposure. Please join me in welcoming Kate Palmer Albers. <laughs> Thanks, Becky. And um, I want to say thank you also to the Center for Creative Photography for hosting this conversation. Um, I'm very happy to introduce Penelope Ambrico this evening. I've been aware of her work for some time, but it made um, an especially big impression on me in 2009 when I saw her sons from Flickr installed at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. My husband subsequently had a photograph of that installation as the home screen on his cell phone for at least a few years after that, so I had ample opportunity to see firsthand the ease with which this collection of other people's sunset pictures traveled and became reinserted back into daily life. It's been a treat to do some writing about her work, and I'm delighted she was able to make the trip to Tucson. Penelope Ambrico graduated from the Ontario College of Art and Design in Toronto and received her MFA from the School of Visual Arts in New York. Over the past two decades, she has shown her work widely, including just in the past few years, in the exhibition One Hour Photo at the American University Museum, up at, the, at the Aperture Foundation Gallery in New York, the Carpenter Center for the Visual Arts at Harvard, the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art, the Photographer's Gallery in London, and the recent exhibit, Drone, the Automated Image, at Le Mois de Photo in Montreal. Her monograph, Penelope Ambrico Photographs, was published by Aperture in 2011, and um, this is um, a copy of it here, and I just wanted to mention there are copies um, available for sale in the lobby, and um, Penelope would be happy to sign them afterwards um, if you buy one of those here. Uh, and she has upcoming solo exhibitions at the Milwaukee Art Museum and the Aldrich is it the Art Gallery. Aldrich Art Gallery, Aldrich Art Museum. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she has received numerous grants in support of her work, including uh, the John Gutmann um, Photograph Fellowship, the, uh, a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and an Aaron Siskin Foundation Individual Photographers Fellowship, among many others. Her work is in, also in numerous collections. A few of them include the Guggenheim Museum, the International Center of Photography, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and the San Francisco uh, Museum of Modern Art. Over the years, uh, she has looked closely at honeymoon resort brochures collected at a uh, wedding convention, pictures of mirrors and stacks of perfect books and mail order catalogs, photographs of office desks and televisions for sale on Craigslist, the latter of which were on view here at the CCP in Lyle Rexer's abstraction show a few years ago, digital images of suns uploaded to Flickr, and recently the mountains photographed by canonical masters of photography as well as by casual photographers in Switzerland. She tracks, categorizes, and collects the photographs we surround ourselves with but often barely notice and represents us with our cultural viewing habits. Her subject, as the title of uh, tonight's um, conversation indicates is photography itself. Please join me in welcoming Penelope Ambrico. Thank you, Kate. And sure. Thank you, uh, CCP, for inviting me also. Um, it's really great to be here. 
so the, the way that we're um, uh, going to be showing the images is a little bit of an experiment, um, anticipating that our conversation would be fluid and we wouldn't have a, an exact arc that, um, that we would follow. You'll see as the images progress that Penelope has put together uh, this, it's called a Prezi presentation. Um, and um, the, maybe you'll talk a minute about the structure of it as well, but you can see that she's created a kind of a um, visual um, uh, organization of her various bodies of work that is not, not linear, but um, sort of emerges from one series to the next. Um, but I wanted to begin, um, we are of course here at the Center for Creative Photography, uh, an institution that is indelibly associated with Ansel Adams. Um, and I, so I thought it was fit, would be fitting to begin by talking about your recent foray into landscape photography, and especially that that incorporates photographs made by canonical mm -hmm. modernist masters of the medium. Um, and this was a project that began with Aperture. Right. Um, and this is where this, this is the experiment to see if this works. And if anybody gets seasick, <laughs> let me know. Although there's not so, much we can do about it. So. Yes. And so, <laughs> well, we could maybe not do it quite so much. Um, let's back up here a little bit. Um, I was, uh, I had a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship at, this, at the time that Aperture asked um, 10 artists to do an intervention into um, their books for their 60th anniversary. And one thing that I noticed, um, well, I was at the Smithsonian, but I was also looking at the National Archives. And I was looking at the National Archives online at one point for Ansel Adams Mountains. Um, mainly because the mountain itself had become a symbol to me um, for, um, well, I was thinking about photography and um, at the Smithsonian I was um, photographing, so this is where the, the work is all connected, I was photographing all the mini cameras in the, the collection of the Smithsonian th uh, photo department and the curator there had brought out all these little boxes with tiny little cameras, these are mini cameras. Um, and um, so these photographs I actually took, took um, with a nice camera, um, and just looking straight down at the boxes and then I put them in um, a vitrine um, so that they feel entombed. You can see these little tags on them. And um, so as I was working on this, I was also noticing that there were mountains, F photographers were um, photographing mountains. I was seeing mountains in galleries and mountains on magazines. There was a cover of Blind Spot magazine that had a mountain on it. And I thought, um, I came up with this theory that the more unstable photography gets, the more pictures of mountains there are. So I was looking at mountains and um, I noticed that these are all um, scans in various ways, uh, scans of Ansel Adams mountains um, using um, equipment that the archivists at the National Archives had at their disposal when they were um, making these mountains accessible. And I think you came to the studio then and you said, isn't that interesting? You, you're the one who actually put this into my head that, that, um, that the archivists were doing the same thing with Ansel Adams mountains as Ansel Adams, no, with Ansel Adams photographs as Adams was doing with the mountains. I in that they were making them accessible. They were making them accessible by the, the, the best means they had. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you can see that in here. Yeah, I guess you can a little bit. So some of these are really, you know, this is like a copy stand image of a, of a print, I think, with a scratch in it. Or maybe it's a negative. Um, this is a very low res digital scan. There are some images that, like, this feels like it was taken out of a book or a very curled paper or something. So you can see space between the record, between the image that's being, or the, the picture that's being recorded, there's space between that and the camera that's recording it. But then in some of them, there's no space. Like, I feel like this might be a high-res scan. Um, so within all of these multiple kinds of reproductions of the mountains, you're recognizing the various sort of um, modes of reproduction right, right. In, the, in the effort to distribute and make accessible right. these mountains. Right. And so I was thinking about that with these cameras and, um, and that led me to think about the master photographer and um, I did a little bit of research on the idea of the master. So I wrote this little piece. Um, but it really sort of came down to the idea of um, 
the male head of a household or a master um, artist, someone who holds high rank, and then an original movie or recording or document from which copies can be made. And I, I really liked that, uh, that schism. And then mountains, which are these things, but they're also um, a large surplus or a commodity. And then ranger, who, you know, if Ansel Adams was, uh, or if these, if these photographers were um, roaming the mountains to take pictures of mountains, they were rangers. And so I looked up ranger, mm -hmm. and it said also, see, rain, I looked up range and for mountains, but then also ranger. Um, but I liked that the definition of range was like the series of mountains, but also, um, you know, the distance between a camera and the subject to be photographed. And then a ranger is a person who wanders the, ra the ranges, and then also, this is just, I loved this, um, a series of nine American moon probes launched between 1961 and 65, the last three of which took many pictures of, the, of, that is yeah, remarkable. of yeah. the of the moon and then crashed to the moon. So, yeah. So I decided to um, just look at the Masters of Photography series and then rephotograph all the mountains with as many camera apps as I could download on my iPhone. And so... Um, and these are apps that you're finding in, in all, you know, all just in the app store, right? Yeah, so right, all, all right. different photography right, filters. Right. Some okay. of them are free, some of them are 99 cents. I love the ones where like people are like, you know, I read the, the re reviews of them and people don't like it because it's a great app, but it was 99 cents, it was too expensive. <laughs> I'm like, you spend $2 on your coffee every morning and you're not gonna spend 99 cents on an app. Yeah, but um, yeah, so I had something like, I don't know, 60 or 70 photo apps on my iPhone and I ended up using only about 20 of them, you have mostly. Your, you have your favorites. I have my favorite. Yeah. So you went yeah. and you photographed, well, you're, you'll tell us. You went and you photographed the mountains, within, the, the mountains that appeared in the Aperture book. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually just, I should have like, um, yeah, so um, let's, let's see if we can go out again. Okay. So I photographed the mountains that just appeared in the Aperture book, and this is, sort of an example of some of the individual images from the, in, here's an example of um, a mountain range. I think this might actually be a Weston. Um, and this is the edge of the photograph. And this is the page, the paper without the photograph on it. So there's a line in this. And the other thing that is kind of great about the iPhone um, re-photographing things as you're looking down is it has a gravity sensor in it. And um, so, you know, here I am looking at the, the most stable object in the world that photographers can photograph. Um, and the prints of the most, or not the prints, the printed matter of the most stable photographers in the world, the masters, and using the least stable camera I could possibly find, or the camera apps that are changing all the time, with all their filters, which are ridiculous, and I have a list that I'll show you. And then the camera itself has a gravity sensor, so when I turn it in a particular way, the mountain flips. And so the stable mountain becomes this kind of disorienting, psychedelic colored thing in the end. And I, I really enjoyed this. It was also a kind of great excuse to use these apps, which I've always kind of wanted to use because they do such beautiful things. Um, but I, you know, I would never, here's some more, um, yeah. So, well, and I have to say, one of the things that um, was so interesting visiting your studio was that you you pulled out your phone and you you know sort of flipped through all of these images and um, you know I was sort of thinking, oh, how are you going to be able to reproduce that that experience in an exhibition or you know in the public? And I mean, actually, what you're doing right here is a little bit like that, the sort of scrolling through. But you do ultimately present you in in these photographs. You did the the. Um, correspondence between a digital image that is circulating mm -hmm. in an immaterial way online and the physical uh, object that it you know may once have been was then reproduced then you photographed it right. now it appears on a gallery that's a tension that I think comes up very frequently in your work is that right. that uh, dialogue between the physical the digital and the, and the physical, physical yeah and the singular and the multiple mm -hmm. and the, yeah um, I thought you were referring to this because these are yeah. these were the vintage yeah so these are the vintage prints. Can you see the cursor here? Yeah. Oh yeah, good. Okay. Um, the, um, these are the vintage prints of um, all of the images in the books that I re-photographed, which are over here. But some of them we couldn't get because they're so rare, you know? And I, I loved that, um, I loved the, 
the uh, absolute singularity of a medium that was actually considered to be a multiple medium before we had digital photography and now is considered, you know, not considered but experienced as a very singular. Yeah, yeah and, well, and that's something that comes up, I think, a lot in your work as well, is this, yeah. this sort of tension between uh, the, the, the presence of something and the, and the disappearance of it, right? So right. in a way, I mean, it's not, that these, it's not that those photographs have disappeared, but they were, so those are images that you weren't able to secure, they, you couldn't find them in collections or they wouldn't, that you couldn't they get wouldn't, a loan? They wouldn't let them go. They right. wouldn't, they were too rare to be brought to Aperture. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Or the, you know, maybe the insurance was too expensive and they couldn't do it, but there was only this one that they could find that, um, and they wouldn't allow it to be in the show. Um, so these were the, these place markers. But I also think that there's something interesting about this and being here today, too, that um, on the contrary to, like, the singularity of these editions, which are so precious, and, you know, maybe there were five printed or 20 printed, and, well, maybe even... You know, I, there was an edition, and the edition had to be all the same. Um, I just love today. I was in the, um, the I was looking at Ansel Adams prints, and um, just this idea of using, allowing his work to be kind of used as a teaching medium, and and that there were so many variations of all the prints, and um, in, in some ways he seems like a visionary. In you know, and I just discovered that. Um, I was told by Leslie that he had um, all these letters that he'd write. He'd like write eight, eight letters a day to somebody. You know, it's like he's like a modern day tweeter. You know, like um, sort of but with a typewriter. Desire to you know, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really, really great. But yeah. Um, so let's actually back up a little bit. So this is some of the more recent work you've looked at, and um, go back to the <laughs> Suns piece, which um, is I. I think the work that you're the most, that you've gotten the most recognition mm -hmm. for. Um, and this is a piece that is, is very different, I think, from the, the Aperture Masters of Photography work because it, the source material is not, you know, sort of famous canonical photographs, but instead it's... Um, the exact well, opposite, Well, really. I mean, mostly the exact opposite, yeah. but material that is sourced from Flickr and um, that comes, oh, I haven't seen that one. <laughs> well, this the is material that yeah. comes from Flickr and could be made by a professional photographer, or could be made by just you know, sort of um, casual, everyday photographer, um, but, is, but has been uploaded onto Flickr. So do you want to talk about the sort of genesis of this project um, or something well, else about it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that in opposition to, to the CCP and really like Adams and the Masters of Photography and um, well, the Aperture's Masters of Photography and the Mountain. Um, what I'm most interested in with the sun is that it, it's, it's actually, there is a kind of stability about it, but it's always moving and it's the singular object. And um, um, it uh, is always, photo we've, we've worshiped the sun since we've had, you know, since we've known about, cult you know, since we've had, consciousness, since, yeah, since consciousness, yeah. Um, and so, um, the the um, the participation or the you know the act of taking a photograph of a sunset is actually a participatory act. Nobody takes a sunset in order to make a photograph that doesn't look like a sunset, like the typical sunset. When you take a, a photograph of a sunset, you're actually interested in participating in, or you're not maybe interested in it, but you in fact are participating in the whole history of sunset photographs and. A sunset photograph that doesn't look like a sunset photograph would not be the one that you would share with your, you know, you're there with your romantic lover on the beach and there's a beautiful sunset and you, you wouldn't take a picture that the sunset is like, you know, black and looks like a bloody, you know, whatever or something, you know, it would be, have to be this romantic sunset that really, you know, um, this would be the sunset and, oh, it's a little, it's getting too big there, it's getting out of focus, but, um, so I was interested in the script of that kind of a photograph and um, the ritual of it, right? Yeah, the col right. sort of collective ritual of but it really all of these pieces yeah. coming together. And it started really because I, the first time I searched in 2006 on Flickr for sunsets, there were 500,000, and it was the most tagged uh, subject on Flickr. And to me, that was kind of phenomenal that we have this one singular sun, but there would be that many of it online, which seemed like a very yeah. 
Right, and this list that you're showing now, and this is something we were um, talking about earlier today with some of the graduate students, is that the 500,000, you know, the, the sort of relative volume, right? 500,000 now seems like almost nothing. Right. right. I mean, when you're comparing it to 13 million, and you said it's, it's, it's 16 more than million 16 now, million. Yeah. And that yeah. There's a certain point at which you just sort of shrug. Yeah, <laughs> it's know? like, yeah, it okay. was phenomenal yeah. to me up until about 8 million, and then it just started like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. At a certain point, you've got enough. Yeah. There are, we have enough sunsets. Right. Well, and that, but the reason I think that this piece has to keep going on, like I'm going to do this forever, I guess, because um, it will get up to 32 million. You know, it'll be a, you know, it'll be 32 trillion at some point, and um, you know, maybe 10 years from now, or maybe two weeks from now. I don't know. You know, like it, uh, it, it should just keep going until it stops itself. Like I, yeah. So let's talk about the process of this as well, because in this case. Um, with the, the Masters of Photography work, you were photographing uh, the complete image, right? Mm -hmm. And in this case, you're cropping uh, whatever the, the sort of amateur photograph was, you're cropping it down to just focus on the sun oh, itself. Actually, right? in the Masters of Photography, I was, I'm not photographing <coughs> the complete image. I'm, um, I'm, oh, well, really, yeah, yeah, okay. I'm really just taking the mountain. So mm -hmm. a, lot of them, a lot of them are kind of unrecognizable. Right. Just because I'm just taking the peak of something and there might be like a field in the house and yeah. So is there any difference for you in that working process when you know you're working with an Edward Weston or an Ansel Adams photograph versus, you know, some a, a Flickr user you've never heard of? Yeah, because this one is an absolute engagement with the idea of mastery. Like this is, um, and it actually kind of changed when I invited the public in the Swiss Alps to respond because then it became more like the sunset piece. Mm -hmm. Where, um, so I was, I'd done this project with Aperture and um, there's an installation. Um, let's see, so I'm still learning how to use this, this program a little bit. And then I did an